Brother Hastings, why don't you come? You know what I want to do, Dennis? I'm telling you, I really do believe this is of the Lord, and I want to do it because I believe it's something God just put in my heart while we were singing. Would you guys come, those that will, and just embrace each other right here around Dennis as he prays to start this service? I want to see God do something special tonight. You know, it may be that the next Spurgeon, the next Moody, the next great preacher, the next great evangelist is right here in this room. And I want God to have his way, you know. So just come and grab a hold of Dennis, strangle him if you have to, you know. And let's all, come here, come here, brother. Give me a hug, man. Give me a hug as we pray, all right? <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us, Lord. And Father, we just pray there be one in our midst that doesn't know you as personal Savior, that tonight would be a night that come to know you as personal Savior, Father. We pray there one here saved, hadn't been baptized, that... We need to take care of that, Father. And, Lord, we have church membership open all the time. We just pray, mm -hmm. Father, you would be with this service and now. You would speak through our pastor, Lord. And, Father, we just might see your movement on us, Lord. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. Brother Dale Hafer Sr., come here if you will, all right? Hey, I want you guys to know something really special, okay? I want to tell you something really special. In the last few weeks, last couple months, probably a good while, but in the last couple days especially, uh, David's, where is David? Is he in the back? Oh, he's over here, okay. Yeah, all right. Da David, who is Dale Hafer's senior son, has come to Jesus Christ. And that is because his kids have been bonkers on him about it. And tonight, David's getting baptized with his kids. Think about that. <laughs> that is crazy awesome, man. Praise the Lord. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? I hope I didn't steal your thunder. No, you're fine. You're I didn't fine. steal thunder. Right? No, not at all. <laughs> all right. We have any new people here? Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, there's one. I see him. Yeah. All right. I want David, everybody to go around, give everybody a hug, shake their hands. Amen. And then you can line up and give Barry a kiss. <laughs> That was good, man. That was... <laughs> Come on, Ryan, baby. Bring it in, man. <laughs> I gave you one today. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I see you, Jeff. <laughs> oh, you're crazy as you can be. You're just as nuts as everybody around here, man. Praise the Lord. Oh, man. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. I love you, too. <laughs> Praise <laughs> Pastor Bluff. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's uh, come together and sing our first hymn, number 680, oh, All right. the Way My Savior Leads Me. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, Though a spring of joy I see, 
gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothing mortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my soul through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my soul through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. I love that song. Have a seat, if you will, dear ones. David, what the Lord has done in your family is an absolute miracle. And what I've seen happen in Carol and in Dale and all of them, you know, except for Cameron. Cameron's still a jerk. But everybody else <laughs> has really changed in dancing. <laughs> I think David, Cam probably is more instrumental than all of them with reference to talking to you about things and helping understand and but, David, we're just blessed by you. And this church loves you. You already know that. You know, it's funny. You walked in here, and I said, I never looked down this guy in my whole life, and I already love him because of his family. How many of you know that sense? You realize, hey, I, I love people in different places that I've never. When we go on missions trips and we've never met someone, God just brings a love in your heart for them, Amen. even though you've never met them. David. According to your profession, David, now Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you've received him. You are sure that you're going to heaven. Uh, Brother David, according to your profession of faith and what the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah, Dave, just be careful. It can be a little bit slick. We've had a couple people fall. One guy broke his neck. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's never happened. No, no, no. Come on in here, Isaac. Man, you know, Cam, Cam might be the meanest of them all, but Isaac's definitely the ugliest one, man. I tell you. <laughs> Isaac, you're just such a blessing. Now, Isaac, are you sure Jesus is your Savior? Yes. God has saved you. You're going to heaven. The blood of Christ has cleansed you. Praise the Lord Almighty. Listen, Isaac, according to your profession of faith and what the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. All right, Joey. Everybody knows you're the favorite one, buddy. I tell you. Come on, man. You know, I think the reason everybody likes Joey. Go slow, buddy, okay? Go slow. I think the reason everybody likes Joey is because his cheeks are so pinchable. <laughs> Isn't he a good-looking kid, I tell you? Joey, are you sure you're saved? Yes. Jesus Christ cleansed your sin, and he came in, and he is your Savior. All right, you know you're going to heaven. According to your profession of faith, Joey, and what the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded me to do, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> All right. Hey. I'll tell you what, grab a hold of that one, uh, what is it? I will sing. Do that one, okay? Just play.
doing marvelous works. Continue, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. I think this is Travis Smith on here. Watch there this. There was an old man who was a farmer, and he had a horse, but his horse ran away. And the neighbors came by, and they said, well, this is really bad. And he said, maybe. Then the next day, the horse came back with seven other horses with it. And the neighbors came around, and they were like, this is really good, isn't it? And he said, who's to say was good or bad? Then his son got on one of the wild horses and he was trying to tame it. He fell off and he broke his leg. The neighbors came back around and they said, this is horrible. And he said, maybe. The very next day, some officers from the army came to recruit and they did not accept his son because he had the broken leg. And the neighbors again came around and said, this is really good, isn't it? And he said, maybe. I'll tell you that story because out of everything that happens in life, we have no idea what the outcome will truly be, whether it's something good happening and something bad could be the outcome or something bad happening and something great could be the outcome. Right. That's yeah. similar to how my life verse speaks to me. It's Romans 8.28, for all things work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purposes. I had a bad accident, but from this accident, I got to witness to different drivers and different nurses. I thank God because at least three of the people that I witnessed to accepted God Amen. in their heart, accepted <laughs> Christ. Praise and the Lord. They're on their way to heaven. Amen. I became injured, but it was able to lead people to Christ yeah. so they could have eternal life. Wow. Praise God. Can I have the ushers come up? All of all in that video, I, I, I'm glad to say he, he's a good brother. I've known Travis for a while. More of all about that accident, think about what he's done. They told him he wasn't going to live past this. And the man is walking now. <laughs> the man is about to get his uh, another vehicle and about to start driving. And I amen. say amen to amen. God because it was God all him. Good. God is good. <laughs> so I'd like to pray over the uh, thing. Just remember, he only asked for 10%. Yeah. He gives you everything. Yeah, he does. So that, to me, just means he's awesome because he deserves everything. Yeah, he does. So, Lord, I come to you, Father God, thanking you for giving me something, Father God, because I don't deserve it. Lord, none of us deserves it. Lord, go into each of our hearts, Father God. If it ain't even money, Lord, just our time is worth it for you, Father God. Lord, put it on our hearts, Lord, and take every uh, thank that everyone gives, Lord, and you're definitely blessed. In your gracious love and name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Is your mic on, buddy? There we go. There, there it is. Go. Hey, now it's really on. Um, I'm in a lot of need on Friday nights. Um, this past Friday, we had five new people. There's a lot of people out there that are hurting. Right. And I can't do this on my own. Yeah, and they're coming back. I'm hearing that. They are I'm coming excited back. excited about that. They are very Donna's daughter, back. some of it. Man, it's really good to see. Yes. And so, I mean, please pray about it. I mean, there's so many people out there that you guys know that you might not know that they are having problems. Mm -hmm. And they need help. Amen. I've told you before, uh, last June was 35 years that I've been sober. Mm. Amen. Amen. And there is, I was just talking to Dave L, 11 months. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a, one of the gentlemen that was here had heard about the program and was wanting to come check it out. And he is 35 years sober. Wow. But... There is people that have, I mean, two girls here. Just starting, yeah. Just, just it's like they're, they're going to do this program together because they, they want to get sober. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's, there was a gentleman here, one arm, one leg, and he basically lost the limbs because of drinking and stuff. Wow. And... Another gentleman that was here, um, he just had a major heart attack, or stroke, I should say. And he, they said, we don't know why you're, why you're alive. Well, we know why. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's right. And God has grabbed hold of him. He's working on people. He's working on so, I mean, people. Pray about it. Amen. See what God can do in your life to help somebody else's Amen. through this program. Amen. And God leads us al al along. Amen. I don't know how many of you know this, um, but hopefully you do, and let's give it a try. Amen. Let's stand together, dear ones. Sing, dear ones. Sing it out. Shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the waters cool flow, and weary and free, he leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives us song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on a mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in a valley in darkness of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night and all the day long. Through sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water some through the blood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives us all.
the night season and all the day long. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, if you will. Uh, this Wednesday, Jesus is speaking, and he's telling us in the Gospels some things related to persecution. And he's basically giving us a game plan. So here's the title for Wednesday night. Jesus' game plan for persecution. Jesus' game plan for persecution, what the Gospels tell us to do. Now, the Word of God gives us in those four Gospels something specific. And interestingly enough, very practical, you'll find step by step what God is able to explain to us about persecution. So I'm praying that you'll be here. Uh, the interns had a meeting here in just a little while ago, and it was really neat to hear some of the comments from those that are already interning, and exciting to see some who want to, and that is exciting. You keep praying for them. Pray for the future of people who are wanting to go into ministry. Uh, the baptisms tonight, to me, were extremely sweet because the Hafers, some of them are going to be leaving. And so you pray for them. I'm excited about having had them here during the summertime. And I know they're getting ready for school here in the fall. And uh, I'm going to miss Isaac. I'm going to miss Joey, especially little Joey's cheeks. You know, his little... No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, next week, don't forget all the VBS stuff. I won't get into all of that. You already know the Outside the Box Talent Show, all of those things. There is food still in the social hall. It's not just bread, it's meats as well in the freezer, in the bottom of the freezer. So those hams that are there, they're fair game, okay? Reach in there, grab a ham, take it home. If there's anything there on that table, take it home and use it for the glory of the Lord. Guys, go right ahead. Uh, if any of you were uh, around back in the old days when we were over on Bradford Street, every Wednesday night we used to be down in the basement and we would uh, uh, sing songs with a guitar here. And this is one of the songs we used to sing. <laughs> Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Hey, everybody, clap! And I'll fly away. Lord, oh, do, Lord, oh, do you remember me? Do, Lord, oh, do, 
do, Lord, I do remember me. Do, Lord, I do, Lord, I do remember me. Way beyond the blue. And I'll fly away. By and by, I'll fly away. away. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I tell you what. Brother Keith, I went uh, back here just a minute ago because I thought, you know, that, uh, that, that I should go wash my hands and use the facilities there. So I went back in there and there was water all over the floor. Because, of course, we just had baptism. And I want you to know, Brother Hale, I nearly flew away, all right? I flew <laughs> away. My feet nearly went out from under me, and I thought, I'll fly away for sure, okay? <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, if you will. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. Brother Kachichian. How many can say that? Let's see. Brother Kachichian, say that. You ready? Here we go. Brother Kachichian, this guy was a Uruguayan gentleman. And I'm telling you, these fellas down there do everything. A lot of times you get to thinking about folks around the world and what they have to do to subsist. Brother Kachichian had a great church, a large church, a very founded church, great bus ministry, exciting school fantastically large congregation, uh, several hundred people, but he also had a business, and he was also doing things constantly with real estate. So basically, he had three jobs. You think to yourself, how does a guy like that do all that? How do we just completely ignore our own limitations and go beyond what we think that we possibly can do and just get to the things that you think, man, that's impossible. I've watched ministries where I thought, how do they, you go up to Solid Rock Baptist Church and you look at all that ground, you look at all those buildings, you look at all the things that have been done, you say, how is this possible? Well, I think Ultimately, the first thing that has to be thought of is no one did it. God does it. And so I want to give you three thoughts from Hebrews chapter 4 about getting more done. How do I work more effectively at my job? How do I continue with the Lord and have even a better walk with the Lord? How do I get to a point where my life isn't mine anymore and the Savior takes over and does above and beyond, isn't this what the scripture says? Above, I love those words, above and beyond what we could ask or think. I mean, now I got to tell you, oftentimes we get on Pentecostals, we get on the Charismatics for this faith idea. You know something? Every once in a while I do a good Baptist once in a while just to be a little charismatic, you know. It do us well to get to a point where we realize that faith is real and individuals who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ on any level are going to see some things happen they didn't think could happen. Why? The scripture tells us above and beyond what you could ask or think. You say, now pastor, you, you really rev it up, right? You really do it. You just go. No, no, no. You trust. You trust. You trust in the Savior. How did he do all that stuff? I mean, I watched Brother Ketchy John. He's an old guy. And he'd get up in the pulpit. He'd get up there and he'd say, The Lord bless all of you today. May God give you a great morning in him. I mean, this is how he would talk. I thought, there was nothing about that guy that was bombastic. That was, quote, unquote, huge. Brother Ketchy Chian understood, I don't have to be anybody because God is everything that these people need. I don't need to be something great. I don't need to take control. He'll take control. God needs to take control. 
As you're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, look at this now. This is where we ended this morning and we start tonight. Let us therefore, verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. What is he saying there? Stop it! <laughs> Quit <laughs> trying to be something. <laughs> Quit trying and start trusting. Quit fighting and start resting. You say, but now, pastor, you told us this morning, 24-7, you can really work, and in your work, you find that rest. Most certainly, there in verse 11, it says, let us therefore what? Labor. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall, after the same example of what? That's the problem. That's the problem. Do we believe in what God can do at First Baptist Church? We look at one another. We look at the staff. We look at the interns, and we say, well, we have our limitations. Poppycock! We don't have any limitations because God don't have no limitations. The omniscient, holy, omnipotent, massive, incredible God of all heaven is going to do whatever he wants to do with this church. And you say, well, pastor, does that mean we're going to have 5,000 people? I don't know his plan. All I know is that the plan of the living God of heaven is going to be good regardless of what he decides to do. And guess what? It ain't going to be anything like you and I think. <laughs> Oftentimes, I tell you, people get these ideas, they get these plans. They get, I went to a conference one time, and these guys all oh, were talking about their plans and their ideas. And this 32 church initiative in these major cities, it all failed because they were trusting in what they could do instead of trusting the Almighty God of heaven. I'm not saying not to plan. I'm just saying be ready that every single plan you ever have completely is turned upside down. The Almighty God of heaven just says, I'm going to get that through your ways, your thoughts. He says, your ways are not my ways. And my thoughts are not yours. My stuff is way up there. And you're just down here on this earth. And we in this place even look around and we think, what a blessing it is. To have my brothers and sisters, consider, my friends, how microscopic First Baptist Church is. How massive our God is. How exalted, how lifted up, how millions upon millions of people. I believe, I really do believe, millions are still coming to Jesus Christ. I still believe that around the world, people are getting saved. And you know what? As much as people talk about how the, the darkness is coming upon us and all the horrible things, my God is still winning. He's still winning. And he's going to continue to win. And I get excited about seeing what he's going to do in the future. As you're looking at verse 2, it says, Unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. With what? Faith. I want you to, again, just to think of three things. Rest, number one. Number two, the word, scripture. And number three, prayer. You're going to see throughout chapter four, you're going to get through the entire chapter. You're going to see throughout chapter four those three principles. First and foremost, I can rest in Jesus Christ regardless of whether or not I think I can. Oftentimes you get to a point where you say, you don't understand, Pastor. i got to get up every day. got to do my, there are responsibilities I have. Yes, but all of that done with anxiety and frustration, irritation, it just gives you this sense of, it's all on me. Years ago, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said, you have to work as if it all depends on you and pray as if it all depends on God. I used to say that all the time. I don't believe it anymore. I think you need to work as if it all depends on God too. You pray as if it all depends on God, but man, work as if it all depends on God. Because as you appropriate His power working through you, you're going to rest. Even in this preaching time, I said, Pastor, you kind of psyched tonight. You just kind of psyched. 
Listen to me, my friends. Even in this preaching session, the Almighty God of heaven is taking over and He wants to talk to you. Now look at verse 3. For we which have believed do already. We enter into rest, as He said, as I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In Uruguay, we all took naps at noon. In fact, the whole nation shut down at noon. I got to tell you, the first few weeks that I basically got to where I was ministering, because it took some time to get to a point where I understood the language, understood the folks, understood the culture. In those first few weeks, I'd go out, big dummy, at 1230, <laughs> 1 o'clock, to tell people about Jesus Christ. You knock on somebody's door and it's taking a siesta, you're a big dummy, you know. This guy would come to the door and say, what in the world are you doing? Oh, oh, you're an American. Okay. <laughs> you know, shut the door in your face. <laughs> no visitation, no staff meetings, because the staff are going to be sleeping too, you know what I mean? No big deals going on. So what did I do? Well, I started taking a nap at noon. Every day. You know what I found out? I'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, do a five or six hour work session, take my nap in the middle of the day, and do another six or seven hours at night. It was phenomenal. It was great. And then I tried to get back into our culture. <laughs> it didn't work so well. It didn't work so well for me to be taking a nap. Because then I was the one on the phone saying, don't you know it's time for a siesta? And everybody's like, no, it's not, because you don't live in Uruguay anymore. <laughs> Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. And he said unto them, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Now, I don't know when this was said, but I got a feeling it might have been right at high noon. <laughs> it might have just been right in the middle of the day. The Lord just said, hey, why don't we take a little siesta time? You know, my friends, I got news for you. Even little kids understand the value of a nap once in a while. You say, oh, Pastor, that's not what this passage means. And I agree with you. This passage is talking about the Sabbath day. And you know something? I think we need to take it seriously. Our Bible tells us this, keep the Sabbath day holy. We don't always do that. Say, Pastor, you've mentioned over and over again that sometimes you work every single day. I would hope and pray that you, as long as I'm your pastor, will take time to rest. And I will tell you, there are plenty of times that I just completely shut everything off. You ask my wife, and I'll go in the bedroom, I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I will lay down and take a nap. Might be 20 minutes, but I'm going to lay down and take a nap. Garrett, what did you say the other day about them power naps? What was that? You don't remember? Somebody you had talked with or that was mentoring up there in Solid Rock, you said, yeah, what did he say about that? He lives on power naps. He lives on power naps. Listen, guys and gals, take a second, come apart before you come apart. Allow yourself to rest. And these Sabbath times, you say, Pastor, I don't understand why you think that's so important. It's because if you don't take rest every once in a while, you're not going to be able to do your ministry in an effective manner. Okay, but I, Pastor, I have to work from sun up to sundown. Sorry for you. There's got to be a time that you rest. I'm telling you, we are less effective if we're not resting. Psalm 127 in verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Here, I want you to understand. I believe that this is vital for us. It's not just something that you see throughout the scriptures. It's something that today in our culture is a much needed piece of advice. Don't let America run you ragged. Don't let this nation get you to a point where you think, well, I've got to. I've got all this responsibility on my shoulders. Say, Pastor, you are the last man on the earth that needs to give me this advice. Well, no. <laughs> Shut up, David. <laughs> this afternoon, 
when we finished, I don't know, we get excited about stuff. I thought, man, Garrett's coming over today. <laughs> you know, I, what I want to do is milk a goat. So what we did was we went over to the farm and we milked a goat. And Garrett and Liz, they understood what kind of dexterity you have to have in your fingers <laughs> to milk that stinking thing, man. Uh, she gets fat, man. I mean, she'll give a gallon. Today she gave, what, a half a gallon? Half a gallon. And, man, I'm telling you, they were just <laughs> reefing on that thing. And then we killed the chicken, you know. Yeah, hey, by the way, they don't just do that in the food line, all right, in the back. That gets done in other places, you know what I mean? It's already taken care of by the time it gets there. And people will say to me, I can't believe you do that to those poor animals. You do too. You just don't know you did it. That's all. <laughs> all these things that we fill our lives with, it's great. It's fantastic. Knock yourself out. But remember this. Jesus Christ said of the Sabbath, the Sabbath wasn't so that, understand, this is what he was saying. The Sabbath wasn't so that men were enslaved in it. The Sabbath is for them. He created a day for rest for you to rest. Who knows you better than anybody? Who knows you better than anybody? The Almighty God of Heaven. And we need to rest. You know, one day, He's going to make you rest if you don't. You know, <laughs> I don't want to get crass here, but there is a saying. There is this saying, okay? It, it talks about going to the restroom. And it tells, it, it'll say, if you don't learn to do that when you're young, go when you have to go, then you won't be able to when you get older. And I don't know that maybe that might have some truth to it, but the same holds true with rest. If you don't rest when you're young, man, you're going to wear yourself out by the time you get old. We've got to get to a point where we have balance in our lives. Do this, my friends. Understand the text. <laughs> Liz, Liz, let me ask you this. Over there at the um, children's, what do you call this thing? Okay, it's a daycare. Liz works at a daycare. Teresa, the same thing. Nap time. When does that happen? <laughs> are they too old at that point? Oh, they are. Okay. At some point, the kids do take a nap, don't they? Around 11.30. Believe that God's way of resting every once in a while is the right way. Believe that God's way of rest is the right way. And come apart before you come apart. Look with me, if you will, at verse 4. He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And this in this place again. If they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. I believe, and it's my belief, I understand. People can apply scripture in different ways. But I believe this chapter has several applications. I believe that we ought to rest every once in a while, physically. But I also believe that this passage is speaking of salvation. And I believe that individuals who are still working their way to heaven are lost. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. Very clear, you know it. For by grace are you saved through faith. <laughs> and that not of yourselves. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. We struggle, even as believers, with believing that. We get to where we frantically work. I remember Brother Perez saying to me when we were there in Uruguay, he said, you're not one of those guys that thinks the whole world is going to go to hell just because you go home at night and sleep, right? I thought that was a good way to put it. You know what? God is in control. 
God is in control at 12 o'clock at night. God is in control at 3 o'clock in the morning. You and I don't need to sit around and fret, okay? God has got all things under His control. And we as believers in our salvation must rest in Christ in salvation. Again, He limits that certain day. Now look at verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Are you taking your rest? Your full rest. In other words, as a Christian, have you decided God really is running this church? It's not just something we say. It's not something, oh, that's the good thing. Oh, they, they applauded that. That's a good thing to say. No, it really is the truth. There's no human being, no group of people, no individuals that are going to make the church grow. God alone does that. As you're looking at verse 10, he that has entered into his rest, he also hath to cease from his own works as God did from his. So what do we do? We make our minds, we labor to get our heads around this thing to where we say, God is in control. And when I don't get to it, He's going to do it. He will glorify Himself. So, but it's our responsibility. I don't doubt that at all. I'm not saying we don't have responsibility. I'm just saying that He will enable you with the power to do what has to be done. The second thing you'll notice here is God's way is the best way on scripture not just on rest but on scripture read verse 12 do you see how that this text all fits together Amen. there is a needlework in this text that i believe is very important for us because we look at verses 1 through 11 we say yeah that's all about rest about the sabbath all about resting and salvation we don't get to heaven by works that's all good but do you realize this just goes right into verse 12 and what does it say the word of god is what quick Powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You say, now, Pastor, why is that put right there? It's because God is trying to explain to us, my word is more powerful than any work you could ever do. My word will do whatever needs to take place. My word will not return void. My word is what needs to be spoken from the pulpit. My word is what needs to be spoken in your job. My word is what will do the work through every place and in all things. And Jesus Christ, the word, is what the world needs. He doesn't need Christians who believe that people need us. They need Jesus Christ. You can rest because of the sword. You know, my wife the other day found a gun that I had hid. You say, Pastor, what? Well, you can't have these things out where kids can get to it. You understand? You've got to have locks. You've got to have certain places. You've got to have cubby holes here and there. And she was cleaning, and she was going through things, and she found this back somewhere that I won't tell you about. And uh, she realized my husband has a plan. She doesn't necessarily know the plan, but it dawned on her in that moment, my husband has a plan. I have to tell you something. If you and I don't have a plan with the sword, we've got issues. We've got to plan to be witnesses, plan to be evangelistic, plan to do what we need to do in our workplaces. There has to be a plan with reference to the sword, but rest assured, the sword is enough. Look at this. The Word of God is quick. It's powerful. And why does he say it? Because you can rest. It's all good. I got this. I'm going to take care of this. I have my Word that's going to not return void unto me. Look at me, if you will, at verse 13. I love this. Look at this text. Neither is there any creature, no creature, that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You know something, Brother Garrett? That chicken today that ended up being meat in about 10 minutes, that chicken, God knew when its life was taken.
Every single creature of God is manifest in His sight. Get this. Human beings, God knows all about every one of them. All of us. Every single one. And His Word, boom, shines light on every detail of your life. You say, well, this is hidden. No, it's not. No one knows about this. God knows. God knows. God knows everything. He knows it all. And His Word manifests your heart. I mean, nakedly open. Look at this now, what the Scripture says. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in sight. All things are naked and opened under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Oh, but you don't know, Pastor. I got this one really, really sewed up. No, you don't. No, you don't. Nothing's hidden. Absolutely nothing is hidden. God will figure you out. He already has. He's already got it. Man, he knew a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, all about your wicked, nasty, stinking sin. And he is decided on making sure, for your good, that he exposes that sucker. And he will. My Bible tells me about sin. It says this. You know, your sin will surely find you out. Pastor, it'll find you out too. Well, it has. I'll tell you that. Over and over again. Say, Pastor, is it embarrassing as a pastor to have your sin exposed? No, not at all. (laughs) Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Thank God for this. (laughs) That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. What is he saying? You've got someone interceding. So don't make that commonplace. Don't get to thinking, oh, God is God. Jesus will take care of my... Oh, I'm forgiven. Oh, my friend, sin is sin is sin is sin is sin. He's going to see it. He's going to, he's going to expose it. Listen, believe that God's way of rest is best. Believe that God's scripture's ways are best. That is what this passage is saying. You can trust the Bible to do the work, but do we? You can trust the Bible to do what needs to be done to save the souls of men, but do we? You say, but the Bible still says. How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? I agree. We have a responsibility. But do not go and thresh wheat and say, well, I'm not going to get anything out of this. Have faith that people are going to be saved. Have faith that those at your job site are going to be saved. Have faith that these buildings that we have here are going to bust at the seams by God's grace. That souls, look, don't thresh without hope. Go and do whatever needs to be done. And God will glorify himself. You can trust the Bible to do the work. You can trust the Bible. And do you know who the Bible is in person? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How many of you trust Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Give me a big old fat amen on that. You can trust the Bible to reveal and manifest truth. You can trust the word Christ to act as high priest. You can trust the mighty king of glory to do whatever needs to happen. Know this. He knows sin. Romans 7 and verse 7, will you? Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. We're almost finished. I do do tell you that. Romans 7 and verse 7 is what you want, sweetie. Romans 7 and verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. You see, he knows sin and he allows you to know what sin is by the law. If you're reading the Bible, you'll know what sin is. So this is not just about evangelism when we talk about trusting the word of God. It's about your own sin. You can look into the Word of God and find out what sin is, and you can distance yourself from it. Thank God that He doesn't leave us blind on this. I had not known what lust was, except that the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Last, believe God's way is the best way on prayer. Look at these last two verses. We're down to verses 15 and 16 now. The Word of God says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. 
but was in all points tempted like we are. Yeah, without sin. But my God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you understand. Thank you so much that you went through life. Thank you so much that you allowed us to know how our Christ, our God in human form, was tempted in all points as we are. Verse 16 goes on and says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace with what? Great faith, with great trust, understanding charismatically that you can get a hold of the Lord and just say, my God, do great things. And he says, I will do above and beyond what you can ask or think. I will do way above and beyond what you can ask or think. So we come to the throne of grace with great boldness that we may obtain mercy, that we may find grace to help in time of need. Oh, my friends, I've heard it said before, I believe with all my heart, grace is power. Grace is power. My goats got out the other day. And so I went and I took the fence and I weaved it together with another fence. And we did that just about around the whole thing. And with this illustration, I am finished. But those silly goats are stinking stubborn. I mean, they are stubborn. My neighbor said, oh, you ought to get cows because these are just, oh. <laughs> cows are a little bit, you know, they're easier. But these goats are just stubborn. They're stubborn. So, you know, uh, this morning my wife went. And we had tried to take care of some things, uh, gotten it to where they couldn't get out. And she said two of them had their heads through the fence. And they're just let because they tried to get under it and they couldn't. Because of some of the measures that we had taken. And they had their heads down on the ground like this. All the way down. And their bottoms were up in the air. And they're just sitting there. She said by the time we'd gotten there, she said, I think they'd been bleating and probably uh, worn themselves out because they were just laying there by that time. (laughs) Their heads couldn't go anywhere. And all I could think of was, We're no different. We don't trust him. We don't believe that the limitations he sets for us are good parameters. We're convinced that we could do better. We're convinced that if we work hard enough, we're going to work right through that fence, and we're going to have a whole different parameter than this. i tell you something. Look at this right here, won't you? That right there is all the parameter you need. Stop sticking your head through the fence. Would you stand, my friend? My God and King.
daughter. You're praying for that husband. You're praying for that loved one that needs Christ. Why don't you come? Turn to hymn 578, won't you? Hymn 578. There are quite a few that are still here. A number of folks are still at the altar. If you want to come, there's still time. Hymn 578. Come on, won't you? Simply trusting every day. Trusting through a stormy My faith is small. Oh, Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus and that is all. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by. I'm trusting Him. Oh, whatever before, trusting Jesus. On that last, if you will, trusting Him while life shall last. Trusting Him till. Are you really? Are you really doing that? I pray you are. I pray we are as a church, man. Woo! I see some confidence on faces. I see people who are trusting. That is great. It excites me to see that. Hey, sing with all you got on this refrain. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the day. Trusting Him, what have before? Trusting Jesus, that my God, you hear the refrain of your people, you hear the words of this great old hymn. And I ask you, Father, to make it so in our hearts tonight. I'll glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a restful evening, my dear friends.